Hi, this is outdoors writer David Figura, and I'm here today with two of my favorite, extremely talented outdoor wildlife photographers, Greg Krabus and Diana Whiting. Glad to have you guys here today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's start off. How did you guys get into wildlife photography, Diana? Well, I was a bird watcher first, and then I always had an interest in photography, and it kind of morphed into the two, you know, together. Started out with, uh, you know, smaller lenses, and then, you know, you realize you have to have long lenses, a working distance, so that you, you know, are not disturbing things, and, and it went from there. Greg, how about you? Well, I started out, I, uh, being a dentist, it actually worked out well for me as far as how I do my work. It was almost reverse engineering as far as seeing how light and colors and shapes all came together. And photography was the same thought process. So I loved the outdoors and photography melded both things together and actually became very, very uh, easy to do as far as to be able to envision what an image is and to actually create it and make it happen. For the beginner, for a novice, um, what kind of equipment do you need to get into wildlife photography? Greg? That's a good question because the best equipment you can have are your eyes. And when you first start out, you have to almost pre-vision what you wanna do, whether it's in your backyard, whether it's in our parks and things like that. And then envisioning what captures your attention. What becomes a point after that is, what do you have to capture an image? And what becomes you know, relevant is, do you have an iPhone? Do you have an iPad? Those are very, very limited as far as what you can do. Mostly what we're all shooting with are digital SLRs with, with long lenses, because that allows you, one, to get closer optically than it would be physically to a subject, whereas an iPhone or an iPad, you have to really encroach upon a habitat to do that. So mostly digital SLRs. The key to this is expect that you're going to invest a lot of time and a lot of money into it, uh, but the rewards are phenomenal as far as what you can get. So getting into it, digital SLRs, using uh, lenses that look obscenely large, but it's what you can capture with it. And output is important too, as far as what do you want to do with your images? So your equipment okay. starts first and then evolves from there. Diana? Um, I have a friend that works for the Adirondack paper and uh, you know, she is an older lady, like probably me now, but she has a small, <laughs> uh, she has a small Panasonic Lumix with a, with a telephoto lens ability on it. You know, you can't, change lenses on it. It's a, a consumer camera, I guess. But, you know, she's a naturalist first. So she really gets very good pictures. Maybe you can't blow them up the way you could with a, you know, our equipment. But um, her, her knowledge of what she's doing, um, you know, and what she does with that camera is it's possible for people that want to start out with a smaller budget. But you really have to learn about what you're photographing. Okay, and if you really want to step it up a level, what do you have to do then? Then you have to invest a lot of money. <laughs> I mean, I, I, when I bought my first 500 millimeter lens, which I still have, I thought, you know, I was, felt a little guilty, but I probably use that more than I use anything else. So, you know, it, you have to have the right equipment to get the pictures. You know, because you don't want to yeah. disturb things, you need a working distance. And if you want, you know, behavior shots and things that are natural, you need to have that distance. Okay, Greg? I, you know, that's a great comment. But, you know, when you're looking at your equipment, you almost have to know that equipment inside and out and yes. what its capabilities are. Far too often, you know, as, as photographers go, we're always upgrading equipment. We want more glass, we want more length that's there. And, and most of the time you can mitigate that by just knowing what your lens is capable of, where you have to be, where your position is, where the light is coming from. And you can optimize even with, you know, entry level equipment, some beautiful imagery. So it's not necessarily the longest lens. It's not necessarily the most expensive equipment you can buy. It's you knowing exactly what you can do and then paying attention to the environment around you, but also knowing what your subject is. So that equipment becomes 
something you really have to be a, a close partner with that allows you to really capture some unique images. Okay, okay, I want to go cheap. <laughs> Can I get decent wildlife photography pictures with a with a smartphone, an iPhone? No. What's your thoughts on that? No, I think that um, the people I see with iPhones really encroach into spaces and you know flush things and. I don't, I don't even like my iPhone to take pictures of people, but that's me. My phone is, my phone is not the newest phone, but I don't, I don't think there's enough things on there to control what I like to control when I take a picture, but. Okay. Greg, you can follow up on what Diana said about this whole thing about encroaching on the animal's space, you know, with an iPhone. That just sketch you know? is better. <laughs> you'd, be, you'd be shocked i think i think in, in all light of that you know the best phone you have is the one that's on you and unfortunately with most wildlife experiences that people get into there and, and, and it happens with me too i don't have my camera with me but i have my iphone with me so in cases where you're seeing a unique event that right. doesn't allow you to pre-stage something to actually get into an environment your iphone's perfectly fine but you know you have a barrier you have now a car you could shoot from you can actually do things without getting out of your car and, and you're documenting something so that so an iphone is is definitely a tool it's not the tool that we would primarily use to to take images that you want to do something with most of the time yeah. people taking iphone images where do they go facebook they go on social media and that's where they live whereas i know with diana's beautiful work and the stuff that i do you want to make sure that i want to put it on a wall I want to give it to people. I want it to have some presence and, and longevity. And I think that's right. wildlife photography and imagery has its place, but iPhone imagery and whatever's on you definitely does based on the moment you're in. Um, talk about the importance let's start, of doing homework on a subject you wish to photograph and briefly give an example of where it paid off. Diana? Well, when I wanted to photograph loons, I read every single book that I could find. And then I also drove up and back to the Adirondacks in the evening to hear one of the um, you know, best people that they have up there that's an expert on loons, to hear him speak. And it was worth every bit of that drive um, because I learned you know, what to do, what not to do, what to look out for. You know, Sometimes things like that are not in a book because it's not geared towards a photographer and, and our needs are what we should be looking out for. But now when I go out and I photograph loons, I can be a lot more successful and also know when I need to leave, if, they're, if I'm causing a problem, you know, especially when they have young chicks or whether that loon is people friendly and you know, know my working distance is not bothering them. And I, one of the first things I did was drive up there and happen to be on the first day of a, a loon's life, a baby, and got wonderful photographs because the loon was both friendly, undisturbed, and you know I had this quality time and I got to see wonderful things. But it was a lot of homework. Yeah. Okay, hey, Greg. Time, lots of time. Yes. Uh, especially uh, the eagles on Onondaga Lake, and I've been photographing them for over nine years. And every time that I go out, it's a new education. You're learning something different each time. The subject is essentially the same, but every winner is different, every behavior pattern that's different. So it, it, it becomes a continual process of education that you just build from as a skill set. And, and each time you're doing you know, the, the process of preparing, going out, taking pictures, you, you know what you want to get as far as an image goes ahead of time, you're looking at the light, you're looking at right. the, wind, the environment and all those things that are important and knowing your subject and their behavior and how they're going to uh, become uh, a unique opportunity to take an image. I think that is that wealth of knowledge you get just by, by taking time to do it, but it's time well spent. There's plenty of times you go out there and you get snake bit. You don't have anything. That's for right. sure. <laughs> There's a time you go out and you hit the lottery and you hit four or five images that you're like, wow, out of like maybe a thousand images, you got four or five keepers. That's a great right. day. People think that, you know, with this big equipment, and all this stuff we have, every time you take a picture, it's a winner. 
And that is not the case. It takes, it can take weeks to get the image that you want. Years. That's that what you want. <laughs> um, talk briefly about time effort involved in getting quote, that killer photo that you're proud of. Diana, is it the loon or the, um, anything else you can think of? Well, you know, I have a lot of photographs that I, that I like and some of them are serendipity and some of them are, you know, some planning involved, but I think uh, it is all the same. You have to invest a lot of time, like Greg said, and, and you got to be willing to go out and be in the field, even if it's not going to be, you know, a winter day. It's just right. being prepared and uh, knowing your subject and being willing to spend the time. And you know, every day you're, I'm out, I'm happy to be outside. So I, I try not to be, come home and you know think it was a negative experience. And it's okay. always a learning experience, so. You know. Okay, Greg? You know, with everything we've done for the last six months as far as COVID fever, cabin fever, you know, going outdoors and the opportunity to take pictures, it, it just is so exciting to come to be able to look forward to doing something that we've been able to do. Other photographers are, are probably our greatest inspiration as far as you know, knowing what people are taking pictures of locally because we have a great resource. We got Onondaga Lake that's transformed. You have Montezuma, you have the Adirondacks, you have all the tributaries and lakes around here and, and obviously bird migration. So every, every opportunity to take pictures, boy, there's not enough time in the day that I have or would like to have to actually do it, but. Yeah, wouldn't you like to be more than one person sometimes? Yeah, I, I be... <laughs> <laughs> Have your assistant do the dental work while yeah, you're right. doing the pictures. Um, sometimes so many things are going on, you wish you could just, you know, like the time that I watch Fox is the same time that warblers come through and you have to, you can't be two people, so you have to make your, you know, choice. <laughs> okay. Um, are there ethical practices when it comes to wildlife photography? And can you talk about something that's really frowned upon by wildlife photographers? Gee, I would, that's, a, that's always been a very, very um, conscious effort on everybody's part to one, do no harm and, and to advocate for the environment. You know, when you're looking at an animal, you're looking at a situation, are you there to document or are you there to capture an image? Or are you there, obviously, for your own interests? And I think if there's a buffer that you can maintain, whether it's private land, whether it's you know um, the the safety of that animal or your safety, because it's amazing how many times people get out to take images and they're in harm's way. Right. And, and that is very troubling to other people that are trying to like take pictures and then you know somebody's doing something wrong, which is going to draw negative energy to what you're trying to do and then it ruins it for everybody. So everybody really needs to be mindful of, you know, your safety, the animals, you know, buffer that you need to maintain. And then also, you know, is the image really worth sacrificing any of those variables? You know, if the light's terrible, you know, you don't have the right equipment, then maybe back off and, and try to find another opportunity at another time. Okay, Diane? Um, I would say, feeding animals to get pictures when you um, habituate them to people it never ends well for them down the down the way and I saw on social media someone was you know sitting in the middle of a fox den and, and thought that was a good idea but I think about those animals mm -hmm. later when they're so used to people and and people are so afraid of animals that you know don't show any fear that um, I don't think that is a good idea. So I think feeding animals to get a picture or removing vegetation uh, to a den or a nest site, you know, that, that puts an animal in danger and they're young. And when animals have young, it's one of the times that photographers really get the most opportunities. But I think that that really off, you know, brings us a, res a responsibility to, to make sure that parents are coming and going and feeding uh, young and, and that you are not stressing things out. I mean, my best experiences are when I see a parent coming, bringing in food, 
accepting me, not paying any attention to me. And I'm usually a, a pretty good working distance. There's, there's sometimes that I'm not, but the animal, the animal is um, not stressed or I would leave. I've left when it's either dangerous, like a road situation like Greg is talking about, or if I think that I'm doing something, you know, that is not like, especially preventing young from being fed because Parents don't like to show themselves particularly, you know, my experience are with Fox. So if you do not see uh, the parents coming back and forth to feed them and you stay for a long time, you are preventing, you know, all those young from getting fed. So um, things like that are important mm -hmm. to me. It's maybe the first time in my life that I chose do what you love and not worry about not worry about having a motive for it or uh, I mean, I think I, I've grown into, you know, wanting to advocate for the environment and for wildlife and birds. And when you can make people appreciate something like that, that makes them appreciate something, you know, you have to come in contact with something to appreciate it. So if you can open yeah. people's eyes, that's, that's very rewarding. But for my personal um, journey, it was kind of like, just do what you love and don't worry about it. I looked at it like my college education that I never got. Every time I bought, every time I bought an expensive piece of equipment, I thought, well, you know, you're going to use it and, you know, um, you need it for what you want to do. And I have never looked back. Cool. Well, both of you, thank you very much. You're two talented people and um, continue shooting away. I really enjoy your, your images. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you, Dave.